Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's budget hearing. My name is Councilman Mark Jona, and I'm chair of the Council's Committee on Small Business Service. Today, we will be hearing from the Department of Small Business Service on their fiscal 2021 preliminary budget, which totals $162.5 million. The city's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget was released with a big question mark as it pertains to the state budget. This year, the executive state budget presents an unprecedented risk to the city's budget. We will examine if this will impact SBS's budget and programs over the course of the next few months. Additionally, late last week, the governor announced that he was sending an emergency appropriations bill to the legislator asking for 40 million to fight the coronavirus virus in New York. In addition, the city of San Francisco declared a state of emergency. We want to learn about the measures SBS is taking to assist and guide the city's small businesses regarding this matter. Additionally, we would like to hear from SBS, is it tracking or monitoring the impact of the virus on small business, in particular, the Asian-owned businesses and communities, as well as price gouging complaints that we are recently be hearing from. SBS's budget is spread across nine program areas, some which are related to services that SBS provides, while others represent the expense budget of some of the mayoral office and non-city agencies, which makes SBS as a conduit or just a simple pass-through. It is the council's responsibility to ensure that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to New Yorkers. Hence, as chair of the Small Business Service, I will continue to push for accountability and accuracy and ensure that the budget reflects the needs and interests of the city. As I mentioned, the Department of Small Business Services fiscal 2021 preliminary budget totals $162.5 million, which is $73.7 million, or 31.2 percent, less than the fiscal 2020 adopted budget of $236.2 million. I'd like the Commissioner to provide the reasons for the decrease in the baseline budget and how the programs may be impacted due to this decrease. Additionally, I'd like the Commissioner to explain the impeded increases that we may see in the Mayor's executive budget in May of 2020. The fiscal 2021 preliminary budget also includes funding for new needs such as the maritime inspections in Governor's Island and a disparity st study to review the availability and contract utilization of firms by industry classification and minority group. I'd like to hear more from SBS on both of these initiatives. Of the department's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget of 162.5 million, 27.9 million or 17% is allocated for personal services to support 301 full-time employees across all divisions, which is 22 positions or approximately 7% less than the headcount at the fiscal 2020 adopted budget. I'd like the commissioner to provide a breakdown of the changes in headcount by programs and the reasons for it and remind the Commissioner that currently the SBS website shows 41 job openings are available as of today. At fiscal 2020 adoption, the City Council added $24.4 million to the SBS's fiscal 2020 budget for the Council's Small Business Services and Workforce Development Initiatives. I'd like the Commissioner to update us on the status and the impact of these initiatives. It is essential that the budget that we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and the interests of the Council and the people we represent. This hearing is a vital part of this process, and I expect that SBS will be responsive to the questions and concerns of the Council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the Administration over the next few months to ensure the fiscal 2021 adopted budget meets the goals of the, the Council has set out. I'd like to thank Commissioner Bishop for coming here today and testifying. I'd like to thank SBS staff, in particular Warren Gardner, who have consistently been responsive to our many needs and requests. 
You would not be able to analyze the city's budget at such a detailed level without your cooperation, so thank you. I also want to thank both my staff and the staff of the Finance Division for their help in preparing for this hearing. My Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, Ali Ali, Stephanie Jones, and Noah Mixler. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin, would those who are testifying please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Jonah. I am members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Greg Bishop, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I'm joined by SBS First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon and my senior leadership team. SBS fiscal year 21 budget is $162.5 million with a headcount of 301 employees. The preliminary budget includes pass-through funding that is not spent or managed by SBS. We serve as a conduit for funding allocated for other city entities. Of the $162.5 million, 39% or $64 million is pass-through funding, which includes $27.6 million for the New York City Economic Development Corporation, $21.1 million for NYC and Company, and $15.1 million for Governor's Island. The remaining $98.5 million, or 61% of the fiscal year 21 preliminary budget, is allocated for SBS's programs. This funding supports SBS's mission of economically empowering New Yorkers through our employment, business, and neighborhood services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential for all New Yorkers by connecting New Yorkers to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. During my tenure as commissioner, I have encouraged the agency to work towards this mission while focusing on the idea of equity of opportunity. SBS strives to reach New Yorkers with limited access to economic opportunities, clear their path of systemic barriers to success, and offer tailored services to address the specific needs of our unique and diverse communities. SBS's goal is to not only provide high quality services, but also to focus on changing systems and achieving long-term impacts so that our city can provide opportunities for all New Yorkers. During this year's State of the City Address, Mayor de Blasio confronted the major issue facing our city, including the challenges facing our small business committee. New York City is home to 230,000 small businesses, and it is crucial that we continue to listen and adapt our offerings based on their needs. The mayor is committed to supporting the city's small business, and under his leadership, SBS will be, will be continuing Love Your Local to reach more long-standing businesses, expanding our compliance advisor and small business advocate teams to provide regulatory assistance, and expanding our commercial lease assistance program to help small businesses deal with lease-related challenges. We are also excited that the mayor has committed to expanding fine relief for small businesses, including eliminating fines for first-time violations and expanding the universe of violations that will have cure periods. These initiatives will further enable SBS to help business owners start, operate, and grow in New York City. SBS served over 20,000 unique customers and businesses in fiscal year 2019 through our network of seven NYC business solution centers and nine industrial business service providers, and more than 50 free and low-cost business programs and services. These offerings include business planning courses, legal assistance, recruitment and workforce training services, information on selling to government, minority and women-owned business enterprise certification, and financing assistance. In fiscal year 2019, SBS helped 977 unique businesses receive financing awards valued at $76.2 million. SBS services are available to businesses in their neighborhoods, at their doorsteps, and online. Annually, SBS offers approximately 700 business education workshops across the five boroughs. Al along with updating the content and offering these courses in multiple languages this year, SBS also launched a series of new online business courses. Entrepreneurs can now apply to be connected to upcoming courses on topics including business operations, human resources, and marketing. SBS is also helping small business owners navigate the regulatory environment. Using our web-based NYC business portal, business owners can look up which licenses and permits their specific business needs, view their interactions with the city, and learn how to avoid common business violations. Since launching in 2018, more than 44,000 accounts have been created on this portal. We also bring regulatory assistance directly to small businesses through our compliance advisors, who provide on-site consultations to help new and operating business owners understand how to comply with regulatory requirements. Since launching in 2016, Compliance advisors have served more than 8,000 small businesses, 
educating business owners on common violations and helping them avoid more than $100 million in potential fines. By deploying both in-person and online tools, SBS aims to provide accessible services so that more New Yorkers can build and grow their small businesses at their convenience. SBS also develops targeted programs to address challenges faced by New Yorkers who have historically faced barriers to economic security. Building on previous Business Pathways program iterations, this year, SBS, NYCHA, and City Community Development launched Career Catering Business Pathways, a new initiative to provide NYCHA and Section 8 residents with customized training and resources to start their own catering businesses. Over the course of 10 weeks, Catering Business Pathways provides participants with a professional catering business education curriculum, mentorship, and professional coaching opportunities, support in obtaining the license needed to grow their business, and assistance securing commercial kitchen space. We will celebrate the graduation of the program's first cohort later this month, and SBS is currently recruiting for the second cohort. We would greatly appreciate the assistance of Council in spreading the word about this opportunity to NYCHA residents in your districts. The agency's commitment to equity of opportunity extends to government procurement. SBS plays a key role in the city's minority and women-owned business enterprise program, which supports the growth of minority and women-owned businesses through the city procurement and ensures that our vendors reflect the diversity of our city. SBS certifies MWBs and provides capacity building services to help firms strengthen their ability to win contracts. In 2016, Mayor de Blasio set the ambitious goal of doubling the city's pool of certified firms in three years. Shortly after last year's budget hearing, in, tw in June 2019, SBS achieved this goal and has now certified over 9,000 MWBs. This represents an increase of over 150,000 in certified firms since the start of the administration. Beyond certification, SBS is working to provide MWBs with the resources they need to successfully compete for city contracts. SBS's services for MWBs include capacity building cohort programs, mentorship programs, targeted workshops, and one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. In fiscal year 2019, SBS provided one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to over 1,500 MWBs and small firms and served an additional 1,300 participants through workshops. In response to cash flow challenges faced by certified firms working on city projects, the administration created the Contract Financing Loan Fund. This $10 million revolving fund lets small businesses borrow up to $1 million kept at a 3% interest rate. From the fund's launch in 2017 through January 2020, we have awarded 96 loans in the amount of $20.7 million, opening the door to more than $92 million in contracts for small businesses. These resources are helping level the playing field for MWBs in procurement. In fiscal year 2019, over $715 million in prime contracts and over $319 million in subcontracts awarded by city agencies were won by certified MWBEs. This represents a combined utilization of 26.6%, putting the city on track to achieve the mayor's goal of at least 30% utilization by 2021. This year, alongside advocates, our agency partners, and allies in the state legislature, we successfully advocated for the state to increase the city's authority to make discretionary awards to MWBs again, from 150,000 to now 500,000. This higher discretionary threshold will increase MWB's access to more city projects that are larger in scale and higher in contract value, creating even more opportunities for certified MWBs. SBS provides support for New Yorkers to gain new skills and connect to living wage jobs. Our agency focuses on preparing New Yorkers to seize opportunities in growing sectors of our economy. SBS assists job seekers with a wide range of skill levels through an inclusive growth strategy that ensures community members, employers, and education institutions are all aligned to increase the number of local residents prepared for and getting good jobs. Through our network of 18 Workforce One career centers, SBS connects job seekers with employment opportunities, industry-informed trainings, and a variety of candidate development services, such as resume support, interview preparation, and job search workshops. In fiscal year 2019, we connected more than 27,000 New Yorkers to employment and enrolled more than 2,000 New Yorkers with the training needed to advance their careers. This year, SBS launched construction site safety training for workers who need it the most. The training opportunity is currently available in English and Spanish at SBS's Workforce One Career Centers and through organizations across the five boroughs that serve day laborers. In the coming months, the course will be made available in Mandarin, Cantonese, Polish, and Russian. 
We also developed a small business reimbursement grant to help small business owners keep their workers safe on the job. Through our industry partnerships, SBS works collaboratively with the industry to invest in local talent in sectors including food service, industrial, construction, healthcare, and technology. Industry partnership initiatives that are supported by a budget include job quality programs in home health care and efforts to double the number of tech bachelor's degrees awarded from CUNY by 2022 through CUNY 2X Tech. CUNY 2X Tech is investing over $6 million in eight CUNY institutions to update instruction, bring top tech talent, teaching talent to CUNY, offer tech-specific career advising, and provide on-the-job experience for students. Last fall, the city expanded CUNY 2X to five additional colleges, including Brooklyn College, the College of Staten Island, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, Mega Evers College, and Queens College. These investments will ensure that a more diverse array of New Yorkers have the knowledge, skills, and networks they need to enter and succeed in New York City's growing tech ecosystem. In addition, employers from the industry partnerships are leading the charge on a new way to hire local talent. Through Apprentice NYC, employer partners have hired New Yorkers in positions such as diverse as nurses, computer numerical control machinists, and line cooks, and have provided them with the training and mentoring needed to succeed. SBS budgets enable our agency to help spread and scale this new apprenticeship model of identifying and onboarding talent across New York City. For example, our budget has supported the expansion of our citywide nurse residency to 28 hosp local hospitals, providing over 1,000 nurses with year-long residencies that include specialized training to bridge the gap between education and practice. The citywide nurse residency program is serving as a national model for bringing together hospitals to support the system systematic change that puts nurses on track to succeed. Using the industry knowledge gained from our employers, SBS works with provider partners, including tech boot camps and community-based organizations to create industry-informed trainings across multiple career pathways. From bridge trainings to fellowships, SBS provides a variety of entry points and advancement opportunities for New Yorkers with different levels of experience. We work closely with neighborhood community groups to recruit for all our trainings SBS offers across the many sectors we focus on to ensure local residents can easily access these opportunities. In addition to providing high quality training opportunities, SBS is working to ensure our trainings succeed in connecting New Yorkers to career pathways. In fiscal year 2019, the average annual wage for individuals connected to jobs after training was more than $57,000, which is an increase of more than $10,000 on average from the previous years. In order to address the unique challenges faced by New York City's diverse neighborhoods and business communities, SBS relies on the expertise of local, on-the-ground partners. SBS oversees the largest network of business improvement districts in the country. In fiscal year 2019, New York City's 76 bids served over 93,000 local businesses and invested $167 million in services in neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Our agency provides a bid network at other community development organizations with technical assistance, grant opportunities, and capacity building services that support local initiatives and, stre and strengthen the connection between our agency and New York City's small businesses. SBS works directly with community partners to identify the needs of local commercial districts and plan targeted solutions through our Commercial District Needs Assessments, or CDNAs. CDNAs identify the strengths, challenges, and opportunities within a commercial corridor to better inform subsequent investments. Through our Neighborhood 360 and Avenue NYC grant programs, SBS has worked with community partners to publish 20 CDNAs to date. These grants provide long-term opportunities for awardees to evaluate community needs, hire a full-time program manager, and implement programming based on the CDNA findings. To date, Neighborhood 360 program has awarded, the Neighborhood 360 program has awarded $10 million in grants to 13 community organizations in neighborhoods across every borough. This year, SBS has made an additional $4.5 million in Neighborhood 360 funding available to organizations serving Brownsville, Coney Island, Corona, Flatbush Dismas Park, and Norwood and Bedford Park. For other qualifying low to moderate income neighborhoods, applications are now open for our Avenue NYC grant program. We would appreciate the Council's assistance in ensuring their local community organizations are aware of this opportunity. SBS is committed to serving business owners and job seekers no matter where in the city they are from. To expand SBS reach beyond our centers and network of community partners, our agency conducts outreach throughout the five boroughs. 
Through the support of Council, our Chain One Go initiative allows us to send trained business specialists to canvas commercial quarters and connect with business owners. Since launching in December 2015, Chain One Go has reached more than 18,000 businesses directly at their doorstep. In 2017, SBS launched an additional outreach tool, our mobile outreach unit, to increase our ability to bring SBS services directly to, to New Yorkers in need. Equipped with classroom space and computers, SBS staff used the mobile outreach unit to provide on-site referrals to our free business services, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with MW certification applications, resources during an emergency, and recruitment events to connect job seekers with employment opportunities. I'm always eager to share the work we do here at SBS and to hear directly from you about the daily realities faced by your constituents. I look forward to the continued partnership of the committee as we work to build a more vibrant and inclusive economy. Thank you, and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. One of the um, you note in your opening pass-through funding. Can you elaborate more on the pass-through, the conduit that SBS acts, the percentage of, I believe it's about 40 percent with pass-throughs? Sure. So as, as I mentioned in, in the testimony, our preliminary budget is $162.5 uh, million. Uh, about 17 percent of that, or 27.6 million, uh, is a pass-through to EDC. About 13 percent of that, or 21.1 million, is a pass-through to NYC and company. And 9 percent of that, 15.1 uh, million, is a pass-through for Governor's Island. And as a conduit, is there any responsibility by your department to oversee and gauge um, the use of the money, how effective it is, if any of these programs are working or not, where there could be improvement? So, so our, our responsibility is really uh, to serve as a conduit. Uh, the oversight of uh, the effective use of those dollars uh, rests on the Deputy Mayor of Economic Development. Um, we also, for some of these agencies, for example, EDC, uh, they also, um, uh, are, they, oversight is actually with council, um, and I believe EDC has a hearing next week. You know, we've gone through this so many times, and when we ask some of these agencies or uh, the fund in the pass-through, they always refer back to you. So when we talk to SBS and they say it's about the bus program, we speak to Ed, uh, the Board of Ed, they say, well, ask SBS. And it seems to go back and forth, and it's kind of hard to hit it right in the middle so we can get an answer as to who's responsible for the oversight. So I could clear that up really Thank quickly. You. So for the bus program, uh, we are the financial uh, entity that uh, uh, awards the grants uh, to participants. Uh, so if there's questions about dollars dispersed to the uh, buses, the, bu the bus companies that are participating in the program, uh, we can answer those questions. If it's any other questions about policy, uh, then we would have to defer to uh, the Office of Labor Relations uh, and the Department of, Empl of Education. So then let's continue with the bus program. A New York City school bus grant program, right? It's employee protection provision. In this fiscal 2021 preliminary budget plan, it allocates 18.5 million in the city's funds for fiscal 2020 to support the employment of experienced school bus workers impacted by changes in the Department of Education's contracts for school bus transportation. Why does the preliminary budget only have partial funding for the buses program? This is a roughly $40 million year over year, $40 million grant. And in this budget, we only see 18.5 million being allocated. So the numbers that you're seeing um, is uh, reflective of the fact that this is a reimbursable program. Uh, so the dollars that you're seeing is to cover the months that uh, the school buses, the, the school uh, bus companies have operated. Um, I've, obviously, we have, and we will continue to work uh, with the administration and the budget office uh, for uh, to focus on the future. Uh, as you know, uh, the governor vetoed uh, the bill that would have made this program obsolete. Uh, so therefore, we're working with the Office of Labor Relations uh, to find other solutions. Uh, but in the meantime, we still have to continue to m administer the program. 
Right, but correct me if I'm wrong. Last year, it was forty-one point eight million in fiscal two thousand and nineteen for the school bus program. No, that is incorrect. Uh, so the last year, uh, for the school year, it was thirty-six point one million. Uh, in total, uh, from the beginning of the program, uh, the first year was twenty-eight million. Uh, the second year was thirty-two million, uh, about thirty-two million. Uh, the third year was thirty-six, um, and it has stabilized at thirty-six for the past three years. So if it's stabilized at 36 for the past three years, the number that we're looking in this preliminary budget is 18.5. Did as I said, change? Did the program end? No, as I said, the, the numbers, the, the dollars that we have is to cover the existing, uh, the fact that the, the program starts at the beginning of the school year uh, and it's reimbursable. Uh, so the, the process is that the Department of Education uh, works with the school bus uh, company to make sure that the companies, the individuals that we're reimbursing are actually eligible for the program. The Department of Education will then tell us uh, what and who we can, um, and the number of employees that we can reimburse. Uh, so therefore, the numbers that you're seeing is based on the start of the school year up to uh, March 2020. So between March 2020 and the final executive budget, I'm going to expect a change in numbers just based on the last three executive budgets. Based on the fact that the governor vetoed uh, the bill that would have made this program obsolete, uh, I would expect to see additional funding allocated for this program. So why not put it in from the very beginning? We did it last year. So again, uh, the expectation was that this bill that the governor vetoed would have made this program obsolete. Uh, so now we're working with the Office of Labor Relations to come up with a uh, other solutions. Uh, remember, the, the intent of this program is to ensure that we have experienced drivers uh, that are handling our kids. I think, uh, and we've had a number of hearings, um, uh, budget hearings, where I've talked about this, um, and we've had other uh, drivers, et cetera, come and talk about this program. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the individual behind the wheel of our, our, our school bus uh, is experienced because they are transporting the most precious cargo. Um, and of course, um, you know, our job is to ensure that uh, we uh, issue the reimbursements uh, as, as quickly uh, as possible uh, to the companies that are participating. Thank you, Commissioner. But I just want to remind you that it's only one company that's benefiting from this grant, and there are several companies out there that we hold to the same standard, that we want to make sure that they are uh, qualified to drive our most valuable, treasured uh, citizens, our future. I would say that there's one company that chose to participate in the program. Thank, thank you. I'm sure that the other companies are going to love to hear that, and they'll be applying for those grants uh, should the funding be available. And, and we welcome them to that, apply uh, as well. That won't be the case. Um, we've been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Rosenthal. Commissioner, the governor's proposed 2021 executive budget includes several proposals that would de that, that detrimentally impact the city's budget. Does SBS expect a cut in the budget and does the agency have a contingency plan if the potential state budget cuts leads to decrease in the city's funding for this agency? So the first guiding principle is that we always want to maintain the same level of service uh, delivery uh, for our constituents. Uh, we are working with a budget office. I believe we have uh, some uh, budget targets of um, a budget reduction of 1%, um, at which we are working uh, with uh, OMB uh, to ensure the continuity of services, but also meeting uh, those uh, targets. Thank you. As you heard, uh, with the uh, coronavirus, last week the governor announced uh, that he would send the emergency appropriations bill to the legislator. What measures do we, the agency, have in place, and there are, are there a dollar figure associated with the preparedness efforts? So the, the coronavirus, as you, and you know, uh, we have been, uh, I have actually been uh, working with a lot of these small businesses since uh, the beginning of February, um, where we first started hearing from our local partners that businesses, especially in the Chinatown area, were seeing sales decreases of uh, 40 to uh, 60 percent. Uh, we have mobilized uh, not only uh, our agency, but several agencies in terms of 
uh, ensuring New Yorkers uh, that they could continue to support those businesses. Uh, the mayor was out in Flushing uh, as a show of support. Uh, our local business improvement districts, not only in Flushing but Chinatown, also mobilized and uh, created enhanced uh, marketing services uh, to attract more customers. Uh, we, uh, just yesterday, we released guidance uh, to uh, over 160,000 um, uh, businesses or individuals who are thinking about starting a business uh, to help them uh, understand how to adapt to the changing uh, customer uh, consumer behavior based on, uh, on uh, COVID-19. Um, and we are continuing uh, additional conversations, uh, not only with our local partners, um, we had a conversation today to figure out what we can do to provide additional relief, uh, but we're also looking at our federal partners uh, because there's been legislation that was passed on the federal level uh, that will provide additional support uh, through low interest or zero interest loans uh, for extended period of time. Uh, so uh, that, that legislation was recently passed. Uh, I believe the president signed on, uh, off on it yesterday. Um, and similar to the playbook that we had with Hurricane Sandy, uh, we will work with our federal partners uh, to ensure that we can move as quickly as possible uh, to help those small businesses who are, in, are experiencing uh, some uh, degree of economic uh, impact from this virus. This could be devastating to our small businesses. Um, if New Yorkers stop patronizing our brick and mortar establishments uh, for one fear or another, in particular the Asian community, which is being hit strongest by this fear. Um, you mentioned the decrease in business was how much in Chinatown? So what we are hearing anecdotally, um, because again, uh, we need to, uh, uh, what we've depend on is our local partners. In Chinatown, it's been 40 to 60 percent. In Flushing, we've heard as high as 80 percent. It all depends on the type of business. Uh, so large catering halls, uh, what we're finding is individuals are avoiding any area where they're they're uh, congregating. Um, so there have been a lot of cancellations for large-scale events. Uh, we've heard uh, from our partner in Chinatown that after we did uh, a show of support and the mayor went out, uh, there was a stabilization, uh, but they're still seeing, uh, for example, catering uh, cancellations, uh, you know, banquet cancellations. Uh, so again, what we want to, uh, number one, send a message that, you know, New Yorkers should, you know, stay calm. And I think you've seen the mayor and the governor uh, out on a daily basis uh, and being transparent about what impact is, has happened. Uh, everyone has said that this virus, um, you know, 80% of individuals who, um, if you've contracted the virus, it, it's mild symptoms and you will recover. Um, so we want to make sure that there isn't the atmosphere of fear. Uh, but we do understand that there are some people who will change their, their behavior and may not go out and patronize, uh, you know, our restaurants or maybe our bars, et cetera. Uh, so we are looking at different ways. We've, in the advisory, we have encouraged uh, those restaurants to uh, consider other ways of if uh, individuals are not coming, uh, how can you actually reach out to customers, uh, whether you have an online presence or you want to increase uh, your ability to deliver. Um, and we are also looking at different uh, ways we can actually help them uh, reduce um, uh, or recover from this period of time. So when you say stabilize, that means they don't see the loss of business continuing They've stabilized anywhere between 40 and 60 percent, respectively, and 80 percent. So, have you have you seen any rebound after that? Because when you say stabilize, no. And so, when I say stabilize, meaning it has not continued to drop, right? Uh, but so. it is not anywhere at the levels that they have normally seen. Uh, it is especially, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, impactful on our Asian uh, owned businesses uh, because it was around the Lunar New Year. Uh, and similar to what we have seen uh, with, uh, you know, around the holidays where 20 or 30 percent of your revenues come from like Christmas, Thanksgiving, et cetera, in the Asian community, the Lunar New Year is where it's almost like the Super Bowl uh, for those companies. Uh, so we are especially concerned um, that if this, um, you know, if there's not an increase in sales, uh, that those businesses may have to furlough workers. Uh, there may be other uh, challenges. Uh, so again, we want to continue sending the message of, you know, telling New Yorkers to keep calm, uh, support our small businesses, but we also are working uh, uh, with not only with our local, um, with the mayor's office uh, and with our other agencies, but also with our federal partners uh, to come up with different um, ways that we can help 
uh, these small businesses. It's, it, it's a very fluid situation. Uh, I would not be able to tell you exactly what we're thinking about, but we do have uh, some ideas on some financial uh, things that we can do and some regulatory things that we can do. That's great. Now, I uh, just want to extend an offer to you, Commissioner. Maybe uh, we can continue uh, sending that message of positive uh, to the rest of New York by patronizing local restaurants, and I would be more than happy to go on tour with you as we... Are you inviting me to dinner? As long as you're paying, absolutely. <laughs> um, I would be more than happy uh, to join you uh, if you're paying for it. If not, uh, we'll, we'll let Warren at the tab. I'll be happy to but do that. It would that. be my pleasure to do, actually go out there and reassure New Yorkers that it is safe, that uh, we should continue life as normal, um, and the 301 staff members that uh, SBS has uh, could possibly join us uh, as we hold events at those catering halls uh, that are seeing such a decrease in business. But yeah. Looking forward to figuring out a plan with you. Happy to, to, to go out there in the community with you. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal, I believe you have a question. Thank you so much. A couple of really quick questions. Uh, great to see you, Commissioner. Good to see you, Council Member. Um, I've gone on a couple of these uh, restaurant crawls, both in Sunset Park and in Chinatown, and you know it's great. No one's there. You get great service. The food's delicious. Um, but we need more people coming out to these restaurants, Absolutely. and we need to keep leading the way to let people know that. Um, there's no reason that people shouldn't be eating out. So I appreciate your efforts on that as well. Um, I wanted to ask about the Bridge to Jobs program. Do you, uh, are you getting funding for that? For that? For that was the 60 million that the mayor promised? Bridge program. The Bridge program. So I'm gonna let uh, First Deputy Jackie Mellon. <laughs> um, you're, specifically you're talking about career pathways? Um, Yes. Funding yeah. for okay. bridge training. Yes. Um, we, we, get, uh, we have gotten career pathways for occupational skills training, and we have developed bridge training with, with, uh, with that funding. But I think it's probably categorized differently in the career pathways uh, report, if that's what you're referring to. And how much money do you get for that? We have, or have um, you about seven million. Seven since million's 16. been allocated? Yeah, no, over, well, each year, annually, since 2016. Say that one more time. About seven million annually since 2016. 16, right? Yeah. Okay, and career pathways? That is, that's what I'm talking about. That is oh, career okay. pathways. Which was the other one you were talking about? Um, I, I think, I think, I think, if I'm, if I'm guessing. Okay. Right, no, I no, think no, both no, of them are, you're referring to are from the career pathways um, uh, strategy that the mayor put out in 2016. There right. Were, there were two things, and I'm not going to remember everything, but X number of dollars increase in occupational skills training. Oh, I see. That's that us. It. And X number of, of dollars for bridge training. Got it. And is that stable? Is there any sense that will come down or is there a possibility it'll go up? Uh, well, uh, sorry. Yeah. Good. Yeah, for career pathways, we're, we're, we are continuing conversations with uh, OMB. Um, it, in our preliminary budget, uh, it is not uh, funded for the next next fiscal year. I'm sorry, it's zeroed out. That seven million is zeroed out. Correct. Uh, but last year, it, it, we were in the same situation, um, and it was funded. So we're optimistic that uh, we will continue the conversation with our budget office. Um, so it was only put back in because the city council made it part of a funding deal, but only a one year. Like why wouldn't the why wouldn't has that program been successful? The program has absolutely been successful. Uh, I, I think I don't know if you were here when I was reading my testimony. My apologies. But our uh, the trainings that are funded by Career Pathways, whether it's our, our nurse and residency programs or our uh, com uh, computer and numerical control. This is for industrial and manufacturing businesses, or even our line cuts. We've seen, or even our our tech training. Uh, we've seen the average wage uh, increase by ten thousand dollars to fifty-seven thousand wow. dollars. Uh, so individuals going through these programs uh, are are coming out with decent wages. Um, so they've absolutely been successful. Um, I don't know about the deal that you're talking about. I think Jackie may have. Uh, well, I mean, fundamentally, that. I'm just yeah. curious. That sounds like a path to the middle class. Yeah. So and so, given this mayor, it's all about you know, tale of two cities and trying to 
lift up lower income people. I don't understand why it wouldn't be baseline if it's had such great success. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were going to say, you know, ah, it's really meh, that's one thing, but you're saying it's very successful. Why wouldn't it be in the budget mm -hmm. baseline? Mm -hmm. um, as, as the commissioner said, I would continue to, to talk with OMB. To answer the question you had, though, like why it was originally planned to be a three year thing, and, and then because it was so successful, it was extended last year, and we expect the same this year as well. Why wouldn't it be baselined? Is it something that you expect would only be successful for a year or two? Or, I mean, why wouldn't this fundamentally be a, a program you would? Right. No, we're, we're talking to the budget office about that. Um, but then also remember that we're just part of the overall strategy, workforce strategy for the city. Um, so one of the conversations we're having uh, is just overall, um, you know, working with the Office of Workforce Development, uh, working with our budget office is what's the right strategy for not only SBS, but all the other workforce, uh, all the other agencies that have sure. a workforce component to it. Are some of the other agencies more successful than your program? I'm, I, I'm just, I, I, I mean, even if question. the mayor wanted to carve out this piece and say, let's just make sure, you know, we're checking on all the different bridge programs, workforce development programs, some are better than others. Is this, are your programs just sort of meh or are they great and should continue? I would say they're great and they should continue and that's the conversations that we're having right now with the budget office. Why would it be a budget decision and not a policy decision? Um, I mean, that's a, it, it's part of, again, um, you know, when, when we started this, we had a three-year runway to actually prove the success. We've proven the success. Um, you know, last year we were able to, to get the, the program uh, funded. And this year the conversation will be, I think, along the lines of what you're talking about, that we've demonstrated the success of the program. Uh, so therefore, um, because we've shown that wages have increased, uh, we think that there's going to be an appetite to, to figure out a way to continue this going forward. Into perpetuity? Mm -hmm. Or just for a, is it well, going it, to be a one year every yeah. time? Or? I mean, it, it's our hope that it will be in perpetuity. Baseline. Correct. Okay, great. So that's something the administration wants. It's something that we will continue to talk to the budget office about. Sorry to bust your chops. <laughs> um, it's just such a great program. I would, I'm just surprised the mayor hasn't um, baselined it. And then I want to look at some of your headcount changes, um, noticing a drop of about 22 positions. In fact, um, 13 are from Career Pathway. Oh, is that just because the program's over? I see. It's and because so it's, it's not funded for next year. Correct. And that's 13 people. Correct. Have they been Pink slipped? Have they been let go? No. Uh, I mean, we have funding up until June 30th. Mm -hmm. Okay. G Green Jobs Corps, is that the same thing? Waiting to see if that'll be funded again. I see two positions down. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's correct. CUNY, two times tech, 100K jobs program, same thing? No. Center for Economic Opportunity Initiatives, two staff people. Um, on the, the CUNY2X, we, that's how we planned it, and, and I, so we're, we're good there. Um, Center for Economic, Economic Opportunity, every, this is how it works every year. They, it, they, their funding comes in at adoption for whatever reason. So, and we expect it again to happen this year, because it has every year. But how, I mean, again, okay, I'll, the point stands, if it happens every year, I don't understand why it's not baselined. Um, you know, the mayor has a chance to put it in November, January. Mm -hmm. Is it not successful? No, it is. Um, the CEO initiatives? Yeah, CEO. Is it not such a much? Sorry. Or is it a great one? It, it's a great one. Okay. Um, um, and where are you on the uh, worker co-op staff? Is that, how's that going along? So we have, um, we have a staffer for that. We have a staffer for that. I actually had a really good conversation with her uh, actually this week good. about, you know, uh, economic justice. 
Um, and again, we, we continue to uh, manage these programs and, um, and we've seen the, the gains from uh, the council's investment. Yeah, but how many jobs um, do you have that? Jobs uh, created through the training programs? Um, So in total, uh, job support has been, through, since the start of the funding, has been 775 jobs. Uh, 189 co cooperatives were created. Wow. Um, and we've created, and we've, the, and when I say we, meaning the organizations that have been funded through uh, council's investment, um, have provided over uh, 6,000 technical assistance um, uh, services. And over 7,000 individuals have been uh, educated on local wow. cooperative. And is that a successful program? So, I mean, there's there's a lot of organizations that have uh, has started. I think, you know, again, um, we've seen uh, over five years a number of uh, cooperatives start. Uh, the average lifespan of a of a business, um, you know, I, I think it's time for us to look back at maybe FY15 mm -hmm. and see those businesses that were started then, see where they are now, um, because if they are still operating, then I could say then that's a sign of success, yeah. uh, because the first five years are the most crucial for any new business, whether it's a worker cooperative or, or what have you. Uh, so I think you know for this coming fiscal year, we should probably uh, take a step back and look at you know, the companies that were started and, you know, what are some of their barriers to success or what are some of this, their uh, success. We've had a lot of good uh, conversation with the Center for Family Life uh, because they have a great model in terms of a franchise, yeah. um, which I really like. Um, and the Deputy Mayor, um, uh, Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson has talked about uh, looking at worker cooperative as a model uh, because we have a lot of industrial and manufacturing companies that employ a lot of people of uh, people of color yeah. uh, and whether or not we can focus a lot on instead of creating new companies uh, you know focus on conversion uh, oh, so wow. literally as individuals think about selling those businesses they sell okay. it to the employees um, so will that be part of um, your report this year, both the look back and then trying this other model? I believe in, in uh, this, this, the report that we released um, on, in December, uh, there was sort of like a, a mini look back. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but we could certainly uh, work with you and, and council to, to figure out what would be the best strategy for the next report that we have to deliver uh, in December. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then... Uh, lastly, I just wanted to ask about your MWBE um, uh, certifications. It's sure. amazing how they've gone up. Congratulations. That's all your um, dedication right there, and those leaps are huge. I'm wondering, do you also track how many of those certified get a contract with the city? Yes, we do, and I just want to take a moment to to thank uh, Deputy Commissioner Downshell Gross and, and, the, and the whole DFO team, uh, Assistant Commissioner Helen Wilson, and uh, who am I missing? The, this whole team that's here that worked really hard um, to actually get us to that number. And, um, and, and for sure, uh, the, the best indication of success is the fact that, um, you know, and I, you know I've been uh, at the agency for some time. When I first joined the agency in 2008, we were at a 3% utilization. Um, when the, the previous administration left, they were at an 8% uh, utilization over that six years. Uh, in the same six-year period, when uh, Mayor de Blasio came in, we were at 8% utilization, and now we're at 23.6%. What does uh, utilization mean? So that is the use of MWBEs. Um, and the mayor, in terms of the spend, um, and, right. and that is, uh, there are two goals that the mayor set, um, very ambitious goals, which we actually, you know, we, 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 we met them and we still have one more to meet. Uh, one was double the amount of certified firms in three years, um, and the other was by the next fiscal year, 2021, we will, we will be, as a city, at a 30% utilization. Right. There is positive signs. The first quarter, we were at a 28% utilization, but as you know, we have to look at every quarter, and then we come up with the final year. Uh, but a lot of that has been based on the fact that we've introduced new tools. Uh, we are uh, holding agencies accountable. And when I say we, it is not just SBS, but it's the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. And for sure, the Office of MWB has played a huge role under the direction of General Doris. So um, 
the, to answer your question now, uh, most uh, and in, on average, uh, about two, um, about 25 or 28 percent, depends on the year, of our total base wins contracts. Uh, so if you do the math in terms of like how many, um, uh, what 28 percent of of, of 9,000, uh, but. The, you're asking a great point, um, which is uh, we will continue to certify companies, um, but we have now pivoted all our resources uh, to focus now on increasing that percentage of companies that yeah. win contracts. Um, we do have a great uh, a statistics where uh, individuals uh, who have used any of our services, whether it's technical assistance, whether it's our bond readiness program, whether it's um, just even connecting with our staff uh, in DFO, uh, two thirds of the winners of contracts uh, have used one of our services. Oh wow, that's um, great! So we're very proud of that, um, and we will. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm thankful because uh, the mayor has put in a lot of resources uh, for us to get to this point, um, and we will continue to focus on building the capacity. Uh, how do we get more? Uh, for example, black women uh, own companies, uh, not only certified, but getting them the capacity to win on city contracts. How do we focus on um, the disparity within the disparity? Um, yeah. So there's a lot that we're doing, um, and happy to follow up with you on just the comprehensive uh, work that we're doing on, on all things MWB. That's really exciting. I mean, I guess I'll finish in one, two quick. Um, uh, that's very exciting. I guess what I would want to know is, as you've seen this increase, like is it the same base number of companies that are getting MWB, yep. getting contracts, or can you say of the new ones each year, you know, within three years they get a contract? Yeah, so that's, that's a kind of level of you know. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and that is something that we are are monitoring because okay. we do see some of the same repeat uh, companies. Um, one of the challenges as well is that if you think about the fact that companies that have the capacity to bid on city contracts, uh, they're in demand. So not only are they in demand by the city of New York, but they're in demand by the Port Authority uh, yeah. for all the work that's happening in J you know, JFK and LaGuardia. Uh, they're in demand by the School Construction Authority. Uh, they're in demand by the state of New York. Um, so we need to build a, a larger portfolio of companies that not only have the capacity but can do that work. Uh, so we have a strategy to get and um, in, attract more companies into the, into the portfolio that, that can actually uh, work on those city contracts. I will tell you that the fact that we have and agencies have discretion, and uh, that is thanks to the, the state legislation, legislation that was passed, uh, we are seeing new companies uh, that are benefiting from that because now agencies have the ability to try uh, companies uh, that may not have been able to, uh, you know, uh, be responsive before. Uh, and we're hearing a lot uh, from some of the agencies um, that this method is actually allowing them to, to find new companies uh, to, to uh, procure with. Mazel tov. I guess I would just, the last thing, just sort of wonder if there's, um, if you, like whatever the dollar investment is in, in the MWBE program, if you compare that to the dollar investment in career pathways and sort of think about, you know, um, holistically how we both get these companies, you know, more business, but also make sure that um, we're helping to lift wages. Um, and I don't know if you could do that sort of side-by-side -side analysis or encourage your MWBEs to be hiring um, people through the career Absolutely. path, you know, yep. some sort of connection. Yep. It strikes me that they are equally valid and important programs. And, um, you know, I think um, we need to not take our eye off the ball. Yeah, you're, you're making an excellent point. Thank um, you. And, uh, you know, for the record, uh, most minority women owned businesses, when they hire, they hire within their communities. Um, so they're the largest hiring of people of color, for women, et cetera. Um, so uh, the Department of Defense actually has a formula uh, that we've seen uh, where, because we also run a procurement technical assistance center for uh, the federal government to help businesses understand how to sell to the federal government. Um, and um, using that formula based on the dollar value of contracts, they can predict the amount of jobs created, uh, which is why it's so important for us to continue investing in the MW program. Um, and, it, and it is why um, 
it makes sense for, in terms of an economic development strategy, that we use a certain percentage of the city spend uh, to invest in our uh, uh, our minority and women-owned businesses. I mean, I, what I'm trying to say, I agree with you a thousand percent. My guess is in the Career Pathways Program, yep, we're talking about a similar population, yep. similar demographic, yep. and we want to make sure we're lifting all boats regardless of Absolutely. the venue. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and to your staff. It's, you know, a great department. Thank, Thank you, you for everything. Thank you, Councilwoman. Just to piggyback on some of the questions uh, that the council member asked, on the 100K jobs plan for CUNY 2X Tech, can you be more specific as to what the goals were and where we've come and why are we continuing this program if we haven't achieved those goals? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure when you say we haven't achieved those goals. Uh, as you know, the, the 100K jobs plan uh, is a comprehensive plan uh, that the mayor announced. Um, we are part, we were one of the agencies, one of the multiple agencies that uh, contributed into that. Uh, so the work that I talked about in terms of what SBS is responsible for, uh, the Apprentice NYC work, uh, the, you know, the thousand uh, nurses who have gone through our apprenticeship program, uh, individuals who have gone through our tech training program, our, our food and beverage training program, they all feed into the 100K jobs um, goal. Um, so for CUNY 2X, our job is, um, and our focus and the investments, is really to double the amount of computer science graduates coming out of CUNY uh, the, and into jobs. So those dollar values that you're seeing is really uh, to focus on uh, uh, building the infrastructure of, uh, of CUNY. Um, so for example, um, and the way we, we got to that was the tech companies, we bought them together with our academic presidents. Uh, so these are the presidents from the universities. Um, and the tech companies were able to describe why uh, in CUNY students were not being hired. Um, and the academic institutions were able to tell us what some of the deficiencies were. Uh, so some of those dollars go into uh, not only getting uh, staff um, uh, uh, who are more knowledgeable with the current uh, tech uh, training, uh, but also to help with, um, you know, uh, internships, et cetera. Uh, I can, uh, uh, Jackie Mellon can uh, uh, continue elaborating on CUNY 2X. And, um, I just want to clarify your question. I think, because I think you said if it's over, we're, we're, it didn't work. It's not over, actually. We're, we're only in year three. It's a, it's a, it's a five-year initiative. Um, so the, the staff that we had dedicated, we needed... Uh, more staff to get it started, but now we planned it so that once it was up, we didn't we didn't need the staff continuously. That's if if that's what you're asking about. A little bit about okay. okay. A quick update: where we okay. are, what was the goal? Okay. Uh, because I'm getting conflicting information, meaning that I have a in May, in March of 2019, um, the mayor responded with um, along the lines of it's impractical for the city to track specific jobs created. So if there was a, um, the estimate is more of a guesswork than actually be able to track these jobs with the intent of 100,000 new tech jobs. And you mentioned some sectors there that I don't know if that was part of the program. Food? I, I thought the whole initiative was tech heavy. Uh, it's a it's a combination. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but let me answer your question on, on CUNY 2X for a, for a second. Uh, the initiative was literally to double the number of, of as the commissioner said, of computer science students from CUNY into tech jobs. Where are we? So it, it, it's a it's an initiative that involves um, I think we have eight schools, um, eight colleges, uh, so far. They're at different phases. Uh, so to date, only we're wrapping up year uh, three, I think for two of the schools, and so far, so, so many are just starting, so far we've seen a, about an 18% increase in, in completion, uh, uh, graduation, about an 18, 19, I'd rather, percent increase in terms of the, the number of people connecting to job and jobs afterwards, tech jobs, and a 20% increase in the ish, uh, in the salaries they're attaining there. I think the average is $72,000. So we're, it's early still, but we are on track. Um, and we, we, you know, are, are very uh, excited about more of it. And for the, the 100K jobs, um, the, the 
the mayor, what the mayor announced was uh, connecting New Yorkers to good paying jobs uh, over $50,000. Right. Um, there wasn't a sector specific strategy. There was definitely uh, a focus on um, the actual income. And as you, the, the parts that we are responsible for, uh, as you heard in my testimony, um, you know, just looking back a year, uh, our average wages are, are about 57,000. So we're exceeding uh, the goals that the mayor set for the 100K jobs program. I'm looking forward to following up on that as the progress is being made. And um, I hope we can hit those goals of that were measured. SB1. Is there a line item in um, this preliminary budget for small business first? No, we're done. Uh, no. No. So the so the S sorry. So there is no line item in it, and so the objective of SB one uh, is complete. So the focus uh, for SB one, which was small business first, uh, which started at the beginning of the administration, had thirty uh, goals that we accomplished. Uh, the largest of the initiative was the portal. Um, so as you know, and I've mentioned many times in my testimony, uh, if you go to NYC, um, uh, if you go to nyc.gov slash business, uh, you will now see the SB1 portal. Um, we call it the business portal. And uh, that was a large uh, uh, body of work where we worked with a number of different agencies. And the goal is that when, um, when a business owner logs in and creates an account, they can see a holistic view of not only their, in, their, um, their activities with, uh, for example, consumer affairs, uh, but with the other participating agencies uh, such as uh, FDNY, et cetera. Uh, so the portal was the, the largest part of that. But there were other things, including um, you know, reducing um, and, and focus on like legislative fixes. Uh, so for example, uh, with range hoods, uh, we were able to, and we worked with council to induce legislation uh, to eliminate the back and forth between fire and DOB. Uh, so now a business owner just has to go to one agency. Uh, we were able to focus on uh, additional training, uh, getting uh, handhelds uh, for uh, specific agencies uh, to ensure that they are able to um, you know, uh, 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 provide better customer service uh, to our small businesses. Um, and part of that was to actually look at uh, additional um, uh, regulatory burdens. Uh, part of that work uh, resulted in what we um, announced uh, and that you are part of uh, in terms of looking at the different regulations uh, and in different areas where we can actually either introduce cure periods or um, uh, come up with a way to reduce uh, redundancies. Commissioner, I, and I'm not sure, I thought SP, small business first, the immediate initiative was to get rid of old outdated rules and regulations, make it less, take the bureaucracy out of navigation. Um, we've gone through this so many times, um, and recently I, we did uh, announce alongside of the mayor, uh, we're looking at certain violations that will not, will come with a cure period rather than a fine. Mm -hmm. um, we were into SB first for three years, spent a lot of money. Uh, and at that time, at the end of the program, uh, there was no regulations that were removed um, from the books. We had 80 that were modified, and not a single rule or regulation of up to 6,000 were ever removed. I think you, um, so, so just to correct the record, um, you know, the, there, if, if you're talking about the entire universe of regulations, uh, each reg every business, every type of business has uh, a piece of that. Uh, so if you're opening up a pizza a shop, uh, you have a certain amount of regulations that you have to be accountable for versus if you're opening up a tire shop. Um, so uh, what we have done is to ensure that businesses are in compliance. Um, and part of SB1 was to actually increase the amount of uh, not only outreach that we uh, have uh, to businesses through our compliance advisors, uh, but we are also, we were able to build a most common violations tool. So again, uh, our job was to, to uh, shed transparency uh, and make it easier for businesses to navigate. Uh, I just want to remind you, most of these regulations you're talking about are common sense regulations. It's, it's regulations with, that governs the temperature of food, is regulations that governs the fact that we shouldn't have vermin in our restaurants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in those instances, we want to make sure that businesses understand what they need to know 
um, and, makes, and make sure that we're transparent about it. Uh, but we do, and we, we saw that when we made the announcement, uh, where there are other regulations where a business owner may not know that not only do you have to clean the front of your, your, your business, but you have to go 18 inches out into the street. Uh, so we have decided that we're going to turn that into a curable violation. Uh, and we continue to look so for- each one of those violations now will be curable. So if you have a dirty sidewalk, we'll advise you that your sidewalk and 18 inches into the street is dirty. We'll give it's you not, a cure period, or is it gonna be a one-time notice moving forward? So the the, the goal is, is that, um, and if you remember, because we still wanna make sure that our streets are clean. Um, so if a business owner um, is um, it has a dirty sidewalk, they will be issued a violation, but they can clean and demonstrate that they've cured that violation, and therefore they don't have to pay. Um, so, so we, so we are, um, so we are working with the different agencies uh, to figure out the the best way to implement, uh, because we have a, a certain number of uh, uh, a certain number of regulations that we identified. Um, uh, that we are now working with the agencies uh, to make sure that they're effective, the cure period is effective uh, by, no, uh, by the fall. Sorry, so, so for the, just to, to correct, um, uh, for SB1, SB1 we do have, uh, uh, the, the bulk of the money was uh, for uh, what I just talked about. The, there is about 60,000 that you'll see, uh, and that is for rent. Uh, so part of SB1 was to create a one-stop shop. Uh, so we have a center out in Queens where not only do you get uh, services from SBS, but you also get services from Consumer Affairs, uh, Health Department, Fire Department, et cetera. Uh, and do we have, you're going back to the violations with a cure period. Do you have an idea of how many violations that will apply to? Yeah, we can, we, I don't have the list in front of me, but it's about 75, and we could follow up with your um, uh, 75 new uh, violations uh, that we can provide you a list of. Uh, and again, we are working right now with the agencies, the law department, et cetera, uh, to figure out how we can quickly move to the point where it's uh, there's a some type of cure period for those violations, and it and they're going to look differently. So some of it could be your first your first violation is uh, there's zero dollars, uh, or there's a there's a, a violation, but then if you show that you cured it, then you don't have to pay it. So that's interesting to me. Now going back to that san sanitation violation for a dirty sidewalk or a uh, not 18 inches into the street mm -hmm. not being maintained. Can you walk me through that? You receive a violation, you have a cure period. Zero dollars. Um, that's yeah. what we agreed with sanitation. You correct, you clean. And anything you can't really cure. Right. Yeah. So, so sanitation um, and then uh, 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 first deputy, uh, right, noise, right. First deputy, uh, Jackie Mellon, uh, deputy commissioner Jackie Mellon could uh, add a little bit to this. But for sanitation, for example, uh, if an inspector goes out, sees that there's a dirty, dirty sidewalk, um, that first violation is actually a zero dollar uh, violation. That's the education period. Uh, so now that business owner knows that, okay, you're responsible not only for the front of your business, but also 18 inches. That is it. So if the inspector comes back again and the business owner has a dirty sidewalk, then it is the typical violations that, that we've seen. Uh, but I think, uh, and we have talked about this, uh, you know, we're changing the way that the city interacts with our small businesses. We want to make sure that we educate uh, before we start fining. Uh, so we think that this is a good uh, model where uh, in a business owner will learn about, they may not have known about a particular uh, violation, and so now they know there's not a, f a financial impact, uh, but now they're educated about that. I was getting too excited, Commissioner. When I heard cure periods, I thought this was gonna be great, that we're gonna give our small business a fighting chance to say, yes, you know, you're in violation, cure it, there'll be no fine, it'll be great. But there isn't a single s small business in New York City that I am aware of that is not aware of the sanitation rules. The problem is not the rule, they all know. It's the uncontrollable factors, the wind conditions. You can clean now, by the time you turn your back, there can be a piece of paper that was, the wind blew, 
and you receive a violation. These are the concerns. So when we say curable, and I, I'm thinking more like HPD. Here's an, in an apartment or when a property gets a, a, a property owner receives a notice of a violation get, is given a, a, a cure date. And it doesn't, as long as it's not hazardous and sanitation, although important, is not detrimental, immediate threat to the well-being. So if there was a piece of paper on the floor after you've cleaned your sidewalk, to no, receive a, that's what we're saying. I don't. I, I think you've made. So in each and every case, I inspector comes out today, sees a piece of paper, gives you a notice to cure. You go cure. Two days later, comes back out there. Is it the same you, approach? I, I think maybe a different way to look at this. Like you can't really cure a noise violation or or a, a garbage violation because. There it is, the garbage there, like you, you are in violation. So the concept is you, in those cases, you'll be issued um, a violation, but it will have zero dollars associated with it for the first time. In other cases, there, are, it, there is an opportunity to cure. Um, you know, if- No, but stay there. Yeah. So you received the first sanitation violation with a yeah. zero dollar amount. Right. Essentially. Days later or weeks later, same inspector comes back out to that very same small business sees an un unmaintained sidewalk, what happens? You get to, they get a violation. With a they, fine, with a, with associated with a fine. With a fine. Yeah. Very good. Essentially. So. But we educated because the we business, need, and we, <laughs> need we need clean sidewalks. We need clean sidewalks, yeah. Commissioner, I want to thank you. I thought that was, this was going to be something completely different. Uh, when we say um, cure period, gives you, you're in violation, gives you time to uh, cure, each and every time, and it, it I, also I, I understand. Yeah. I got way excited. I thought maybe we can really be um, responsive to the needs of small business. And I'm, if this is going to be the line of it, that each time there is a violation, we're going to notify you once. Second time, you're paying on issues that we know are repetitive, such as sanitation, such as um, rodents such as some of the other repeat offenses that are normal and we know that you know, despite how many, how attentive you are to clean sidewalks, it's impossible to be 100% compliant 100% of the time. Small businesses all are aware that sidewalks and 18 inches going into the street are their responsibility. They've learned that the hard way and they learn it time and time again based on the number of violations that are issued. I just thought it was gonna be something completely different and if that's it, this may be another smoke and mirrors um, approach. Uh, and I'm I, sorry. No, I, well, I know that wasn't a question but I will disagree with a smoke and mirror. Um, I think you know, um, and again, uh, I'm not the commissioner of sanitation, but I think sanitation has a process in terms of when they go out and inspect. It, it's not a gotcha. Uh, to your point, a lot of uh, small business owners know when the inspection is going to happen. Uh, we are responding to the fact, and I, uh, you know, respectfully disagree with you, uh, that every small business is know, every small business owner knows that they need to clean the sidewalk and 18 inches of the curb. What we've heard from small businesses is that they got a violation because the sidewalk was clean, but the curb was not. Um, so therefore, we're responding to the fact that uh, we do not want to be in a situation where it's a gotcha. Uh, we want to be responsive to our small businesses, um, and we want to educate them uh, before we find them. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the sanitation was a big one for me, um, and I thought this was going to be great given property owners and small businesses an opportunity to correct and cure each and every time uh, on something that is no longer nickel and diamond but really hurting them based on the number of sidewalk uh, violations that are issued for uh, not being maintained. If this is going to be the practice on other areas such as signage, you may not have been aware and we're going to give you a cure period that uh, there's a regulation which we help put a meritorium back on, that's great. You may not have been aware that, um, you know, uh, a specific, your range is not up to date, I'm with you, um, that you may have a cracked sidewalk, 
Is that one of the possibilities that if your sidewalk is cracked and could be a potential trip fall, that we're not gonna give you a violation, we're gonna put you a notice with a cure period? These are the ones that make a huge difference. Um, if it's going to be, well, uh, or your signage inside, the notices that you need posted on a wall, which are city, state, and federal, that if you weren't aware that the font changed or the notice has been updated, and we're gonna give you a notice today um, that you know the, you're, you're, you have to update your signages appropriately, which I would have rather worked with you on using technology as a means to inform workers of their rights and the responsibilities that the employers have would be the way to go so no one's ever in violation. We can update those forms. You currently need a wall of eight foot by 10 foot just to post all of the notices, and that's city, state, and federal. But on the city end, we can lead by example. If it's just a single notice, and then moving forward on repeat offenses, requiring a fine for a different notice, that's why I feel a little deceived. No, that's not, and that's not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. We're saying for certain types of violations, uh, it is a cure period where the first time it's a zero dollar. Mm -hmm. um, but we'd be happy to to, I'm looking to talk to you with about the other, you know, seventy something violations that we've figured out a way to come up with a cure period. Oh. Thank you. We've been joined by uh, Councilmember Perkins, um, and I. Councilmember Levine has joined us as well, and he has a question for you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, good. Um, Commissioner, hello. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, very good. Um, I wanted to ask about, and this is an issue that you and I have talked about a number of times, um, and uh, I think it's it continues to be a big problem for uh, for, for small businesses that are in uh, retail locations, and that's the um, real estate taxes that are passed through to them um, uh, that often they, um, it's very opaque, mm -hmm. um, and we've seen increases, um, as you've heard in my district, um, of something like 70 or $80,000 over a five or six year period from about $20,000 to $100,000 or somewhere thereabouts in a you know, relatively short period of time. Um, can you speak to what, how SBS is approaching this issue writ large, um, how we're assessing how um, property taxes are passed along to um, commercial tenants and what options are out there, um, both on a kind of macro level and a, and a micro level? Right. So, um, so I would say the, the the first part is the best defense um, for a, you know a controlling costs is a fair <coughs> lease, um, because the ability for a landlord to pass through uh, whatever costs, whether it's real estate taxes or maintenance taxes, et cetera, are all spelled out in the lease. Uh, so what we have done, and um, we're really excited that the mayor uh, in the state of city announced an expansion of this, uh, was create a commercial lease assistance program. Uh, so the, the focus for us is really uh, helping our uh, you know, small business owners get access to attorneys uh, to help with the negotiations. Um, and one of the things that we also uh, were able to talk um, the mayor announced was, um, you know, doing some type of a lease uh, transparency. Uh, so really working uh, with the industry and coming up with a standard lease uh, that will actually uh, be transparent about not only your, your taxes, uh, but other costs. Uh, so for example, uh, we've seen business owners who have signed a lease um, and wanted to do one use in that particular space. Uh, just to realize that the certificate of occupancy said a different use, uh, which now adds additional time to change the use of that space. Uh, so there's a number of things that we've heard from small businesses. Uh, I would say that on the sort of macro level, as you know, the mayor has uh, uh, created a commission uh, for, um, you know, just to examine uh, property tax in general. 
uh, we're optimistic uh, um, about the fact that uh, if once a commission comes out and their meeting now uh, comes out with recommendations, mm -hmm. uh, that we'll see some type of balance um, and uh, we'll then uh, s hopefully see some benefits uh, to our small businesses. Uh, but for us, the best defense yeah. uh, is really uh, your lease and having and, and having uh, disclosure in your lease about uh, you know the expected property tax uh, pass through uh, because we've seen you know the, the, a triple net lease is what you're talking about where you know the, the property tax just yeah. goes right through to your rent yeah um, and if a business owner has no clue as what the, the property tax is now and what it will be uh, they don't know how to actually you know uh, forecast uh, their projections in terms of what revenues they need to have in the outer years uh, so that is our focus really is to ensure transparency uh, in that particular area. So, so the, um, the Property Tax Commission uh, is kind of examining this issue in particular, but, uh, how the how those taxes are assessed or um, as a class, or, or is that not necessarily? No, I think, it's, so my understanding uh, is that the commission is looking at uh, just how property taxes are assessed in general. Right. Uh, right. Because as you know, there are some challenges where in, in certain communities, uh, you know, in the property tax is higher than in other communities, yep. and et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's in general. But the trickle down effect would be, uh, you you know, um, if uh, you know, whatever the recommendations come out of this, mm -hmm. um, you know, the 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 assumption is that if there is a level set of, of property tax, then there's some transparency, and then therefore, uh, again, it goes back to our our strategy. Uh, business owners will then uh, be better informed about uh, what that triple, what what that pass through would look like. Okay. Um, and what is the budget of that um, the assistance program? So, currently, um, we're about two two point four million for FY twenty one or for FY twenty. So far for FY twenty one. Twenty one. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member. I believe Council Member uh, Perkins has a question. Thank you, Chair. I, I don't. I want to. Um, this idea of small business always sort of confounds me a little. I, I don't think there's such a thing as small business per se. In fact, in in its uh, uh, I, you know, in its in its totality, small business, especially for communities of a certain type, and especially for this city, is really big business. Don't you think that there is a reason to look at them from the perspective of uh, how much they provide to our neighborhoods, how much they provide collectively in a, in a broader sense of the word? So sometimes it, it appears as if small business is just lollipops and candy and other kind of minor stuff. But in part, from an economic point of view, don't we rich in terms of our small businesses and the, what they provide this, our city and our communities? So um, I would so absolutely. Um, we look at small businesses, and I've said it a number of times. They are the economic engine of the city. So to your point, could you repeat that again? They are the economic engine of the city. Thank you. Uh, our small businesses employ over about 3.9 million New Yorkers, um, and when we the small businesses that we deal with are really micro businesses, and you know. Uh, uh, Council Member Joe and I and I have had a number of conversations about the difference, um, you know, because those businesses, that's why they need our services. Uh, they tend to have five or less employees. Uh, they may not have a retainer at a law firm. Uh, they may not have a banker uh, that they can go to and just get a line of credit. So that's why a number of our resources are, are aimed at those very small businesses to ensure that they have the resources necessary to grow. Uh, so you're absolutely correct. They are, uh, you know, are focused on legacy businesses. Those are the businesses that have been around in communities forever. Um, they're the ones that's hiring. They're the ones that's giving back to the little league. Uh, they're the ones that are providing, you know, the, the the young people in the community their first internship opportunities, their first job. Uh, so we and I've said a number of times uh, that we need to support our small businesses. Uh, we've talked, and the council member, we've talked about. Uh, you know what the changing in consumer behavior will, is doing to our small businesses, uh, and I just remind New Yorkers all the time that they need to, you know, go out, support their small businesses, purchase from their small businesses. But we also are providing services to help our small businesses adapt 
to the changing consumer behavior. So we have courses on uh, how to um, uh, develop an e-commerce strategy. Uh, so if you're a small business and you're not online, uh, when someone moves into the neighborhood, the first thing they're going to do is search online for a shoemaker or something like that. And if you're that shoe um, maker in the in the community and you don't have an online presence, uh, then you're going to get you're going to lose customers. Uh, so we are are operating on both sides uh, to help our small businesses. And in that regard, are, are our small businesses becoming more tech savvy, so to speak, and engaged in some of the more I guess modernized approaches to doing business, right. even as they are so-called small, but nevertheless profitable, and from a community point of view, available, you know, to the yep. to the local neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we work closely with. So the answer to your question is yes. A lot of small businesses have realized that they need to have an online strategy. Uh, whether it's taking courses that we offer or taking courses that our Chambers of Commerce uh, offers. Uh, so I know like the, the, there's a couple chambers who have partnerships with tech companies uh, to help those small businesses develop an online profile. Um, so those are, the, those are the things that uh, we need to focus on and continue to focus on um, because they are slow, they're adapting uh, to the fact that they need to have that online presence. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Commissioner, the fiscal 2020 adopted expense budget was approximately $92 billion, of which Council portion was only about $456 million, or less than 1% of the total budget. However, in the fiscal 2020 of SBS's $236 million adopted budget, approximately $24 million, or 10%, comprised of council funding. Why does council funding support such a large percentage of the agency's budget? So, um, so again, so a, a lot of our, our, our agency staff is focused on delivering programs. Um, and we've had these conversations in the past about um, when council appropriates discretionary funds, uh, there's time and effort in order to actually uh, work with the different organizations um, uh, to actually um, ensure that we get the proper paperwork and we are able to actually reimburse those companies. Um, so though that time and effort uh, requires manpower, um, and without that funding, we would have to uh, reduce programming uh, to help our small businesses, to help our job seekers uh, um, in order to meet uh, the the funding uh, request that council uh, 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 in terms of the discretionary that council places on us. But w the council members have limited dollar amounts available to them to use for their discretion. And these programs, which include, and some of them are uh, well worth it, we've seen the effects and impacts that they have from chamber on the go, construction site safety training, day labor workforce, job placement for veterans, job training and placement initiative made in New York City, WMBE Leadership Association, uh, Neighbor <coughs> Development Grant Initiatives, uh, Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, New York City Cleanup, and Anti-Poverty Local and Speaker Initiative by Borough. That's $24 million of City Council initiated funding, when many of these deserve to be baselined. Put into the budget, not only, and I understand that you have the oversight, but we have limited funds knowing these programs and how effective they are and how useful they are to our small business, what they mean to our commercial corridors and their viability in such uh, volatile times is the point I'm making. What can we do to take the, have these programs baselined rather than have council members use the limited discretionary funding? I think that's a, it's a, it's a good question and it's a conversation that I think council should have um, uh, uh, with the budget office. I, I think there's there's always, um, you know, we are, are in this together. So there are uh, programs that that we have baseline, uh, and there are programs that, that council has funded, um, and and together we have made um, you know great progress. Uh, but I would I would say that that that's a, a that's a that's a higher level conversation. All conversations begin somewhere, I guess, <laughs> Commissioner. The fiscal 2021 preliminary budget includes 200,000 in fiscal 2021 
800,000 in fiscal 2022 and 500,000 in fiscal 2023 for a disparity study. Mm -hmm. What were some lessons learned from the last disparity study regarding availability and contract utilization of firms by industry classification and minority groups? So I think, um, so, so number one, uh, one of the things that we were able to, from the last disparity study, uh, we were able to focus on Native Americans. Um, so in the past that they were, they were not eligible for the program. Uh, so we were able to um, add uh, Native Americans to the program. So that was uh, a benefit from uh, the, the last disparity study. Um, we also have seen um, that, you know, we, we again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a lot of companies that are, are ready, uh, willing, but they're not able. So, um, you know, focusing a lot on our capacity building programs uh, to really, um, and, that, and this is like the, you know, access to capital, uh, this is the back office support. So the um, in my testimony where I talked about us expanding the, the um, trainings for human, you know, uh, HR uh, for the uh, to help with the back office. Those are some of the things that we learned uh, from the disparity study uh, that we need to, to do to help all businesses. Obviously, these studies are important, and the question is the follow up um, based on the Native American. Um, what other results have come out and that, that what steps has SBS taken after the results came out um, and what can we expect from this particular study? Right. So just to, just to um, make sure I, we, we give some context. So the disparity study is actually the, 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 uh, the underpinning of our program. Uh, we cannot have a race and gender program uh, a focus program without showing some type of disparity. Uh, so the study is actually the foundation of the MW program. Uh, so we are required uh, to uh, refresh that study uh, over a certain period of time, so that's what you're seeing now. Um, and the study then dictates uh, what goals we set uh, for each individual uh, group uh, in terms of what percentage, what aspirational goal uh, that we set uh, for each additional group uh, in terms of city procurement. Uh, so the study is really to examine whether or not the MW pro program is, is working. Um, and the goal really is, if you think about it, is that uh, as we move forward and as we are seeing increased utilization, then the percentages that we then allocate in terms of aspirational percentages will decline over time uh, to the point where uh, when we eliminate the disparity, I mean, the goal is really to eliminate the disparity, uh, which is why we have to continue to study. Thank you. So 2020 is an important year, census. Um, has the agency actively started engaging the public in forms of mass communications, whether through events, mailers, flyers, or media, using small businesses uh, as the vehicle to get the, the word out, the deadline, the importance of uh, federal dollars and what it could mean if someone goes uncounted to make up for the mistakes that we've had in previous census? Yes, absolutely. So uh, not only, so we worked with Census on a number of, of different areas, um, uh, but we uh, have uh, worked closely with the Census Office not only to help with like training um, individuals, uh, but also to educate um, individuals who are coming through, like, for example, our Workforce One Center, why it's important uh, for to fill out the Census, our NYC Business Solutions Center, why it's important to fill out the Census. Uh, whenever I have gone to any event, uh, regardless of what it is, I, I mentioned the fact that, um, you know, without, you know, the, 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 the fact that the dollars that are at risk, uh, if individuals do not fill out the census. Um, so we've worked closely with uh, not only the census, but also with ABNY, uh, because they are focused a lot on um, how the business community can help individuals uh, respond to the census. Um, and we will continue to, uh, you know, amplify that message. Um, actually in the next week or two, uh, because that's when the, the mailers are actually gonna go out. Is there a dollar amount that has been associated for this specific project? No, we have been using our, our existing resources uh, to actually spread uh, the message. So that's like social media, email, um, and then our centers, uh, our center staff. On transparency of headcount, can you give us an indication as to um, the headcount loss the current positions that are 
open um, in your portal? And why such a big swing from previous years? So I think, you know, we, when we first started, uh, we had a high vacancy rate. Uh, we've, we, you know, working closely with uh, our budget office and, and um, with council, we've been able to become a little bit more effective. So our, our average vacancy rate is about 8%, uh, which we think is a healthy vacancy rate. Um, on, uh, it represents about 22, um, actually about 26 positions that we're uh, interviewing for. Um, and uh, even though online you'll see a little bit more, uh, some of that is because we've made an offer um, and we do not take down the, the job description until we get approval by OMB because in case uh, when the approval comes, uh, you know, the individual decides to find another job, we want to make sure that we're able to, um, you know, get someone in as quickly as possible. Uh, or uh, we do have uh, uh, non-city funded positions that we do advertise uh, on our website. Do you, can you identify the unfilled positions that currently exist today? If, yes, you follow up. Yeah, we, I, I can certainly follow up with you. I mean, we, uh, if, if you want me to go on, online and, and read out the positions, but I mean, the, they're, they're scattered across the agency uh, between workforce, um, uh, neighbor development, uh, DFO, uh, and even our internal operations. And you feel comfortable with the vacancy rates? You're, they're not alarming uh, to the agency? Well, I mean, 8%, I mean, you know, we have an unemployment rate of like 3. Point, what's it, 4% or something like that. So um, in a, in a, it's a job seekers market. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges uh, we have seen, uh, for example, is in our ability to retain staff in tech. Um, you know, individuals um, are, can make a lot more in the private sector. Um, so, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm really proud of this agency, because the people who are here, they're here because of the commitment to serving the people of New York. Um, and, you know, uh, again, that's the sell, that's the things that we have to do uh, to recruit individuals into the agency because um, they s can certainly make a lot more money on, on, the, on the outside, uh, but the, the most rewarding part is uh, being a public servant, and that's a message I send all the time. So what, what happens when there's a line item for PS and we don't hit the go, the surplus, where does that funding go? Can that money be used for something else, or does it just get refunded, goes back into the general fund? No, it, can, it cannot be used for anything else. Um, are, you, are you saying, like, so if we have not been able to fill a position by, by a particular period of time? Yes. Um, no, the it's... The fiscal so, year budget ends, and new one begins, that surplus. Right. So that just rep represents uh, savings to the overall uh, general budget. Um, but we will, uh, obviously, our goal is always to fill these positions as quickly as possible. So we can't allocate that toward anything else, uh, just? No. Nope. I, mean, I mean, we'd have to talk to OMB, but no. Interesting. Yes, council, council member wants to follow Recognizing up. Recognizing that you, that you can't do anything with that money, I mean, what happens to that surplus? So again, the, the, my, from my understanding, so again, this is more the larger uh, 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 city budget uh, any agency that has savings in PS is, is recognized by OMB as savings. Um, but we, we continue to push to hire as quickly as possible. But even as it's savings, what, what, you're pushing to hire as much as needed and possible, but the savings, what, what happens with that? I, I think that's a, that's a question for the budget office. Uh, I'm not sure what, what happens to that savings. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, can you, um, count, Commissioner, can you please continue explaining some of the new programs that we have in this fiscal uh, budget, including maritime inspections, funding for indirect cost rate issue, brick village demolition, and the NYC Young Men's Initiative? Sorry. Sorry. Um, can you repeat that question again? The question is in around the new initiatives that have been introduced in this budget from maritime inspections to funding for the indirect cost rate initiative, uh, brick village demolition, the NYC Young Men's Initiative, and the construction safety training. Right, so for some of those initiatives, they're uh, related to uh, work that's uh, operating uh, with Governor's Island, um, and uh, for the other initiatives, like the Young Men's Initiative, 
um, that those are all uh, funding that we got for training. And again, our focus is really on uh, connecting New Yorkers to good jobs. I know time is a concern for you, and I promise not to keep you here longer than I have to. Um, The administrator set a goal to have 30% of the dollar amounts of it, and you've elaborated on this, and you feel comfortable where we are. Is there a, on the renewal of WMBEs, is there a decrease on the renewals? Um, on the You're talking about recertification? Yes. So last year, uh, we were about, I think, 101% uh, based on the fact that we were hitting, uh, we were focused on increasing our utilization to uh, our certified target to 9,000. Um, you know, right now, uh, our goal um, in, the, in the MMR, we're measured at um, our utilization being at 60, 60 uh, sorry, our recertification being at, at 65%. Um, so I, I do not think we're going to um, have an uh, issue uh, with our recertification rate. Commissioner, I'm looking forward to continuing the discussions in the budget and making sure that we allocate every dollar possible uh, to the work of uh, SBS and uh, assuring the small business that someone is fighting for them, and that includes uh, giving them a fighting chance from regulations to fines, real estate taxes, water and sewer, uh, on top of all the other challenges that they're faced with. We certainly can do, a, and we've spoken about this so many times, a much better job. Uh, I really want to hear more about the grace period, cure periods on violations and how extensive we're going to make them uh, to make sure that we can, we are supportive of the needs of our small businesses um, and instead of that burden that determines whether or not they stay open. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you and looking forward to uh, dinner in Chinatown. Safe <laughs> travels. Right, thank you. I'm looking forward to uh, Blaze paying. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Would like and like to welcome up our first uh, panel, uh, Sylvia Morse. Um, Julian McKinley, Emily Marie Ramos, and Pablo Benson Sylvia. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Jonah and distinguished members of New York City Council. If you, if you uh, could just hold up for a moment, sorry, the oh yeah, chair's no just worries. returning to a seat. In no particular order, I guess we can start from you. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Jonah, for, and the distinguished members of the New York City Council Committee on Small Business. On beha I'm here on behalf of the 14 organizations that make up the Worker Co-op Business Development Initiative, also known as WCBDI. We would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the economic and social opportunities inherent in the structure of worker cooperatives 
and to share the success that we have achieved through the implementation of WCDI and look ahead to supporting the creation of more businesses, dignified jobs, and shared prosperity for New York City residents in fiscal year 2021. Five years ago, New York City Council made history by passing the nation's first worker co-op development initiative. Since then, over 20 cities across the nation are looking closely and replicating and catching up to New York City. Some cities have already passed similar legislation, Madison, Philadelphia, Oakland, Boston, Santa Clara, while many others are actively considering legislation. Over the same period of this, during the period of this initiative, has created 132 new cooperative businesses, reached nearly 8,000 current or prospective entrepreneurs, and created 631 new jobs that are not only providing higher hourly wages, but are also building wealth and assets for their workers. The organization I represent, the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, is a local trade association representing worker cooperative businesses across the New York City metropolitan area. As a member of the City Council-funded initiative, we have seen firsthand how the initiative has served to bolster our sector, strengthen existing cooperative businesses, and create new ones, which are overwhelmingly immigrant and women-owned. The initiative partners have collectively worked to create a comprehensive ecosystem of support for cooperative businesses that not only ensure the creation of new cooperatives in low-income areas, but also the technical assistance needed to sustain businesses and create jobs, as well as the education and outreach needed for, com for, for communities, interested entrepreneurs, and allied organizations. We urge City Council to support worker co-ops, which provide higher wages and job s s stability to individual workers and their communities by enhancing the initiative, currently funded at 3.69 million to 5.04 million for fiscal year 21. WCDI partners essential service, uh, provide essential services to worker cooperatives and raise awareness about them across the five boroughs. At this point, I would also like to acknowledge the continued support of Council Member Rosenthal um, and many others on City Council for their, for their advocacy for this initiative. We also support, um, as well as the support and partnership of SBS for con as our contracting agency. Um, as the interest in worker co-ops continue to grow locally and nationally, we hope that the city continues to play a role in supporting New York City-based worker cooperatives and nonprofits that support this work, such as the Working World, some of the colleagues that are at this um, table with me right now, Democracy at Work Institute, Green Worker Cooperative, Center for Family Life, among many others that promote um, the expansion of worker cooperative businesses as a means to reduce poverty and income inequality in New York. While the initiative has made remarkable progress in the last five years, the infrastructure needed to support the growing cooperative community in New York needs to be expanded. With increased funding, the initiative will not only continue to develop new cooperative businesses with 42 new cooperatives set to launch this fiscal year, but foster an environment where such cooperatives enterprises will thrive in the long term. With increased support, WCDI will focus on building upon the successes and innovations that you will hear about today from my colleagues in the initiative. You will, we will reach new communities by providing support for more co-op support organizations as we, have se as we have seen growing interest from CBOs, labor unions, academic institutions, among others, that are interested in bringing the cooperative model and co-op co education to their communities. In addition, the ad initiative will continue to have an impact on cooperative creation, on, assisting provi on assistance provided, and on jobs created, with at least 170 new jobs set to be created with this enhancement next fiscal year. We thank City Council for the opportunity to testify, and we hope you will consider our budget priorities and recommendations during this year's budget negotiation process, and look forward to continue working closely with you to ensure hardworking individuals and families have opportunities to achieve economic advancement and shared prosperity for all New Yorkers. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hit the red button. 170. 
Good afternoon, Chairperson Yona and the distinguished members of the New York City Council Committee on Small Business. My name is Sylvia Morse, um, and I work in the Cooperative Development Program at the Center for Family Life, or CFL, a 40-year-old social services organization based in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. CFL has been part of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative since its inception, and we're deeply grateful for the City Council's support for worker cooperative development to fight economic inequality in our city. Um, since 2006, CFL has provided tailored long-term business uh, incubation and technical assistance services to more than 20 worker-owned cooperative businesses representing more than 500 workers and which have generated over $15 million in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, we've also trained 46 community-based organizations in cooperative development since 2012, many of which have gone on to help develop uh, cooperative businesses. Worker owners in the cooperative businesses that we partner with are primarily immigrant women. Uh, among CFL-supported co-ops, 76% of worker owners are Spanish-speaking English language learners, 83% are women, 73% have a high school education or less, and 72% are parents. Uh, prior to joining a cooperative, most of these workers struggled to make ends meet by cobbling together many different low-wage gigs, often in exploitative and unsafe conditions. Um, now, as small business owners, these workers are creating better jobs for themselves and their communities. They're strengthening their families' economic stability and building the skills and knowledge to take on leadership positions in their small businesses and in their communities. Um, in the worker cooperatives that we support in the cleaning sector, for instance, workers on average see their wages double after joining a cooperative. In a 2019 CFL survey, the majority of worker owners reported that joining a cooperative had enabled them to become more financially stable and independent and to establish savings. WCBDI is not only helping to start worker-owned cooperative businesses, but is innovating models to scale worker ownership in communities historically underrepresented in small business ownership. CFL developed Up and Go, which is a cooperatively owned web app for worker cooperatives from across the city to jointly market their services. Uh, Up and Go helps cooperatives more quickly enter the market, compete in the digital gig economy, and share in the wealth that's generated by technology and transforming their industries. Uh, CFL launched the country's first worker cooperative franchise, Brightly Cleaning. Uh, through shared branding and, branding and business infrastructure, the franchise reduces many of the barriers uh, for worker owners to start up and sustain successful cooperative businesses. These approaches, like all of the WCBDI's work, um, have made small business ownership accessible to our city's most vulnerable workers and garnered attention from across the U.S. and internationally as models for equitable economic development. Mm -hmm. We thank you and urge your continued and enhanced support from the New York City Council for worker cooperative development in this fiscal year 2021, which will expand transformational small business ownership opportunities for workers as an essential part of the portfolio of the Department of Small Business Services. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Emily Marie Ramos. Um, I am a native New Yorker. I grew up in the Lower East Side in Spanish Harlem uh, in New York City public housing, Lillian Wald Houses and East River Houses. Um, I am here representing my worker cooperative, Jaime Madre LLC, as well as Nick Knox Advocacy Council, Green Worker Cooperative Academy, our business incubator program, East Harlem Preservation, and Just Leadership USA. Um, I come to this work as someone who has been personally harmed by marijuana prohibition in New York. My father was criminalized and arrested for selling marijuana in Baruch houses in the Lower East Side. My father lost 12 years of his life because of, um, because of marijuana prohibition. Um, he spent it in prison. Um, and still, after being released from prison, he's still struggling to rebu rebuild his life 27 years later. Um, my father has been barred from living in NYCHA affordable housing, receiving funding for higher education and access for traditional employment. Uh, my father was able to start his own small business as a general contractor, being the first person in my family to have a business license. I'm now the second person in my family to have a business license. Um, thank you to the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, 
uh, Green Worker Cooperative Academy, our business incubator program, and New York City Network of Worker Cooperative, our trade association. Um, I was able to receive the benefits of this initiative um, and recently graduated the Green Worker Cooperative Academy in the South Bronx in January of 2019. Since then, we have been hev heavily involved in advocacy, organizing, and community education. We have hosted three marijuana forums um, in, the New York, in New York City, in the Lower East Side, and Spanish Harlem, in co-sponsorship with Assemblymember Harvey Epstein and Assemblymember um, Robert Rodriguez. Um, the Manhattan Borough President, um, Gail Brewer, was also present at our Lower East Side Forum. Uh, we are members of the Start Smart campaign to legalize marijuana in New York with equity, reparative justice, and community reinvestment so people like my father can be, be, um, begin to rebuild their lives. Uh, we host CBD 101 workshops in senior centers in East Harlem, debunking stigmas and stereotypes around hemp, um, and educating the community so that their relationship to the plant changes to one as medicine and not one that's related to trauma because of criminalization. Um, we host educational community events, we phone bank for legalization, um, and we sponsor lobby days with Drug Policy Alliance. Um, our next two lobby days are on March 11th and March 24th in Albany. Um, we received our first grant from Green Worker Cooperative Academy this past year for our advocacy and education work in the community to help legalize marijuana in New York uh, for $4,444. Um, we just received our LLC in September of 2019. Um, this past year, we also hosted events for National Expungement Week. Uh, we are one of over 40 cities across the country that were hosting events um, to inform people in the community on how they can get their records expunged, what are the criteria for expungement, um, in co-sponsorship with Community Service Society, uh, Legal Action Center, and Legal Aid Society who was leading the expungement events as well as some of the public defender services in New York City. Jaime Madre, uh, my worker cooperative, is now the lead organizer for National Expungement Week in New York City. Mm. Our work expands beyond marijuana legalization. We are part, uh, we want our government to divest from prisons and corrections and invest in our communities. We are in support of Just Leadership USA's Build Communities platform to divest from corrections and police and invest in building communities and education, career and job training, business incubator programs, affordable housing, parks, mental health services, community, center, uh, community centers, uh, the small business services, um, the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, which supports organizations like our trade association, Nick Knock, and our business incubator program, Green Worker Cooperative Academy. Um, when I was here testifying for the public safety hearing around marijuana legalization, I was here um, listening to the testimony from the corrections officers um, and heard statistics like there are two to one correction officers to prisoners in prison. Um, so we could literally but cut their budget in half and be able to use that money to invest in our communities. And their budget is very high, close to a billion dollars. Um, we can't pass down a job, but you can pass down a business. Um, you can pass down land, you can pass down a home. By investing in worker cooperatives, we're investing in creating intergenerational wealth in our communities so that we can support and sustain ourselves. Worker cooperatives are good for the community. We give back to the community, as you can see, by the work that we do. Um, we also stimulate local economy. We are part of the economy and often uh, spend our dollars in the economy that we're a part of, and we're good for the environment. Um, you know, Green Worker Co-op is green because we're eco-friendly, not because we incubate marijuana co-ops. Um, we're also in support of campaigns like the Public Bank, which if we legalize marijuana in New York because of federal regulations, we would need a system like the public bank to be able to store um, our money. Um, so we really just encourage that we start to tackle the issues um, at root, which often stem from poverty. And by investing in our communities, we can support our communities to sustain ourselves and create a solidarity economy. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, uh, no problem, whenever you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson and distinguished members of the committee. It is always an honor to address you, but especially today as I submit testimony in support of the hardworking individuals and families in our communities. Uh, my name is Julian McKinley, and I am the Senior Communications Director at Democracy at Work Institute, also known as DAWI by some of our closest partners. 
Uh, on, behalf, on behalf of DAWI and the 14 organizations that make up the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, we thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, to economic development within our communities and Worker Cooperative's unique ability to establish, grow, and retain community wealth. Our organization is headquartered in two places. Uh, we're, we're anchored here in New York, but also in uh, California. Uh, we have staff who conduct business in support of worker ownership throughout the United States and in internationally as well. Uh, in our role as an organization created to expand, ac uh, expand access to worker ownership for communities affected by economic and social injustice, we conduct an annual census of firms. We monitor growth of the sector. We identify trends and successes and challenges as well so we can grow and improve over time. Um, I share this because this work gives us a unique view, both a bird's eye assessment uh, that is combined with an, an intimate approach to supporting workers and aspiring worker owners in New York City. Um, over the past five years, we've recorded a significant shift that began when New York City Council made the historic act of investing in community wealth building through this initiative, the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative. As a result, New York City has, has now has the largest worker cooperative ecosystem in the country, um, surpassing San Francisco this past year. New York is home to the largest worker cooperative in the country, that's Cooperative Home Care Associates located in the Bronx, and they have over 2,000 employees. Um, when we look at, at worker cooperatives and the benefits, we kind of, lots of times people think of worker cooperatives, number one, as sort of like a niche, something that's kind of like special and, you know, it's an enigma, how do we do this? Um, but when you, when you get down to the bones of it, first of all, it's a, it's a business. Um, it's a partnership. Yes, you're sharing profits, um, but there are many, many benefits, including while lots of businesses continue to grapple with like, okay, how do we manage to pay all of our workers a living wage? Worker cooperatives are paying an average of $20 uh, an hour, which is well above minimum wage. Um, Sylvia just mentioned uh, Brightly, the franchise that was started at CFL. Um, they have uh, their, their workers who are, who are at Brightly, um, they, many of them were, were making $10 an hour before. This is home cleaning. Um, and now with the cooperative, they're making up to $25 an hour. That's a huge difference. Uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit. <laughs> um, in general, worker cooperatives have the potential to address chronic economic and social inequalities that are faced by our communities, um, including their most vulnerable residents, uh, and this is made possible through city council funding. Um, the three largest worker co-ops in NYC are in low-wage occupations dominated by immigrant women of color. That's home care, it's cleaning, it's janitor janitorial services, and these cooperatives are transforming these industries by improving working conditions, they're increasing average pay, uh, and creating opportunities for growth through training and access to equity. Um, thanks, to, thanks to the council, WCBDI has been able to like, really, tran really transform the promise of worker co-ops into a reality. Um, year after year, we have met or exceeded our goals. Uh, Pablo mentioned we've created more than 600 jobs in the time of the, over the span of this initiative. Um, we've reached over 8,000 ent entrepreneurs through education and, uh, and uh, technical assistance. Um, and we've created more than 130 businesses. Um, we're asking you today to, to really continue the, the support. Um, and as we continue to continue our work, the more money that we get, the more work we're able to do, obviously. Um, and I think our track record really shows that we're making an impact and we hope to continue that with council support. Thank you. I believe council member Perkins had a question for you. And First, I wanna just thank you for your heroic efforts. I mean, it sounds very fruitful and healthy and so whatever we can do from our perspective and as, as you know council members and, and and concerned about our communities please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have a newsletter put us on your newsletter li list so, so that we can sort of uh, follow up with the good work that you're doing which uh, we'd like to see obviously that happen in our respective districts and so thank you for this uh, report Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Levin has a follow-up question. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to thank, uh, thank you all for your testimony, um, uh, Ms. Ms. Ramos. Uh, I just want to thank you as well for calling attention um, to the need for us to have real infrastructure to create community equity with uh, legalization of marijuana likely um, to happen this year. I heard the governor say that he's not leaving Albany uh, until this is in the budget. So, you know, I take him at his word, he's the governor. Um, and, uh, and so that would mean the end of this month would hopefully be the legislation that enables that. 
we need to, ha so we've in my office worked on real legislation to create um, uh, a marijuana equity program in, in New York City um, that absolutely has to extend to people like your father who um, uh, have really borne the burden um, for really the rest of society um, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of, of his incarceration and, and, um, and what he's had to do then. Um, that has not happened to people that look like me uh, who, uh, have, have, um, who have used marijuana for, for the last several generations. Um, and it's really important that we in New York State make sure that it's not um, just large corporations or people that have their foot in the door or people that have access to capital and people that have access to um, investors and uh, big money um, that are, are going to see the benefit of this. It has to be in, in communities, especially people that have been impacted. So I just want to thank you for your testimony and, and we hear you loud and clear and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much, I really appreciate that. We're actually working on rolling out workshops to teach people how to transition from the unlicensed market into a marijuana worker cooperative. And my incubator program, uh, Green Worker Co-op, is launching a Canna Co-op incubator course for marijuana cooperatives specifically. So we'll keep you posted, thank you. Let's work together, thank you so much, thanks. Thank you, uh, council member, thank you very much, panel. Can we have uh, the next panel, Andrea Bowen and All Young King? in no particular order. Um, thank you, Chair Janai. My name is Andrea Bowen, Principal Bowen Public Affairs Consulting. Um, and thank you, Councilmember Levin. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Perkins. Uh, thank you, staff and the Committee on Small Business for this hearing and the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm speaking today primarily on behalf of the Sex Workers Project at the Urban Justice Center. Um, sex Workers Project provides client-centered legal services to individuals who engage in sex work, regardless of whether they do so by choice, circumstance, or coercion. Um, one of the first programs in the nation to assist survivors of human, human trafficking, Sex Workers Project has pioneered an approach grounded in human rights, harm reduction, and real-life experiences of our clients. Um, one of the budget asks being made by Sex Workers Project uh, at the Urban Justice Center is $48,000 within the Job Training and Placement Initiative contracted by SBS. Our program is a proposal to fund the operation of sex worker community empowerment groups, which uh, will meet regularly with a curriculum that includes financial literacy and planning, safety planning for the sex trades. Um, so looking at like making sure whether if you're in the sex trades, you can do your work safely. Um, job skills for the sex trades, job readiness for jobs in the formal economy, if that's of interest. Um, and also leadership skills, things like speaking to the media, community fundraising and organizing, and organizational governance with like the hope that folks can also take part in the organization itself. Um, this will pay for like metro cards, staff time, et cetera, to run these groups. Um, sex workers marginalized as they are in the formal economy are in need of services that build leadership skills and provide affirming pathways to both safer work experiences and work experiences in the sex trades and skill building for the formal economy. Um, you know, and the majority of workforce programming for the city is for youth, um, and there's while well, Workforce One centers are very helpful in connecting adults directly to employment. Um, uh, we're the only organization specifically directed towards sex workers at Sex Worker Led that also provides employment skill building services like this. Um, and given the effectiveness of credible messengers, um, so people from a specific community imparting skills to that same community, um, the services provided in our um, in our funding application, uh, which would also be sex worker led, are a rare and integral model for uh, providing employment services to sex workers in New York City. Um, we believe in meeting people where they are with a harm reduction and human rights centered approach. 
um, and we just want people to be able to have the tools to be able to live their lives the way they want. Um, so uh, in conclusion on that point, uh, we're just asking for $48,000 in the Job Placement and Training Initiative um, for uh, this service, which, is already, which has previously been funded by, um, I think, the Annenberg Foundation. Um, so we're just looking for council funding to continue the programming. Um, I also just want to note, um, I also work with Nick Knock, um, and as a transgender woman, um, I support the increase for the Workforce Cooperative Business Development Initiative, um, as I know that, you know, transgender people, gender nonconforming and non-binary people are frequently locked out of the formal economy, and WCBDI provides an opportunity for trans people to be able to make their own jobs and be able to, you know, survive. So um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm also submitting a separate testimony about WCBDI and its impact on TGNC and B folks, transgender non gender nonconforming and non-binary. Um, but, uh, and I also have a fact sheet on uh, sex, worker, sex workers projects uh, asks for this here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Chair Yonai and the New York City Council Committee on Small Businesses. Um, my name is Ayoung Kim. I'm the Small Business Project Manager at the Asian American Federation. As you are aware, I'm sure, the Asian-owned businesses in the city are contributing tremendously to the city's economy. They have taken up up to <clears throat> about half of the net new ec economic activity as well as half of net new economic, uh, net new hiring between 2002 to 2012. But yet I'm here to testify that there is not enough support for the small business owners that are Asian American that have language, uh, language, language capacities that deter them from engaging with the city agencies naturally, um, and they need more support to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks of all the regulation issues that you are already aware of, and also to make sure that they are assessing the s services that is given by the city agencies to help the small businesses. Um, one of our prod proudest programs right now from the federations is the Small Business Assistance Program, where we're helping uh, about 100 merchants along the Union Street corridor in Main Street uh, um, in the Flushing downtown and the problem is we are about to lose funding for this issue our contract with the NYC DC is ending in, in um, June 2020 and we are fearing and our merchants are also fearing that they're not going to be able to continue to get the technical assistance that we give and also they're not going to be able to have that access to the council members that can actually advocate their needs and their concerns for what they see on the ground um, as the small business program, uh, we have facilitated roundtables with the SBS and also the deputy mayor's office to make sure that these concerns are delivered to the persons that can take care of them and also make sure uh, that the language barriers or the confusing regulations are properly communicated to these merchants. But the problem is we see that even today, um, I'm getting calls from our merchants asking what the plastic bag ban, or whether they're exempt or not, and, and whether they're going to be able to get their taxes exempt on this issue. And there's so much um, inconsistency and also lack of adequate language um, in language material to make sure that the Asian small, uh, small business owners are also informed at an earlier stage so that they're not being hit with regulations and violations. Um, on top of that, we see that the problem that we saw in the uh, Main Street area in downtown Flushing uh, due to parking, uh, parking slots being lost and also gentrification and rent issues. I know um, Councilman Levin is working on this, but there is not enough bridge or access for these individuals to actually come to talk to you and tell you what they need in order to deal with these problems. Um, our budget as for the community on small business is $1.25 million to provide immigrant small businesses with the in-language technical support that they need to thr thrive in the city. With this funding, we plan to maintain and expand our small business um, assistance program to serve pan-Asian small businesses in Queens. Uh, in more detail, what we plan to do with this uh, funding is to provide informational seminars as well as technical assistance, inform small business owners of regulation and policy changes from the get-go so they don't get lost out, and also to make sure that they get pro uh, adequate quality in language material to guide them through issues of violations or inspections so that they don't get doubly um, burdened with the 
with their lack of capacity to be able to communicate with the ins inspectors or not knowing their rights. We also want to create in-language guides for how to start a small business properly so that we don't have merchants as we see today that will operate under business licenses on somebody else's name, for example, or who just go into a, a, a commercial lease at, um, where they don't have the proper CO, but they don't know these regulations or what their rights are right now uh, because of the lack of an understanding. Chair Jonai, if I remember correctly, in last year's um, oversight hearing, you asked um, Commissioner Bishop, why isn't the SBS doing these things? I gotta say, like when it comes to Asian merchants that are new here and that have language barriers, it's very difficult for, for them to actually go to the city agencies or even their own council members that are not Asian out of fear for retribution or not knowing whether they can have a trusting relationship because of what they come from, where they come from. Um, they've been burned by the government back in their home countries, their families are often under persecution, but also more importantly, they just don't trust the government agencies because it's the government inspectors that always come after them. So they, when we held the round table for the SBS commissioner to meet the Korean American business persons, they were thrilled and they were almost in disbelief that he wanted to talk to them and he wanted to hear out what the problem was. We believe that there's a lot of room for improvement, especially when it comes to Asian small, biz uh, small business owners. And I want to point out to you that when it comes to the small business centers run by the SBS, there's only two in Queens right now, one in Jamaica and one in Astoria. These small business owners can't travel that far to get that help from these centers. And we want to make sure that we maintain our presence in Queens. I want to thank you, Ms. Kim, for that testimony. Uh, but I want to piggyback a little bit on, I wasn't going to ask you the same question again, why is an SBS doing this? We've gone through that. I'm glad the commission was out there. But on the coronavirus uh, outbreak and scare, have you seen a tremendous impact in, in your community, Absolutely. Asian community, yes. small businesses? Hmm. What would you say the decrease in business has been since the scare um, and the fear factor mm -hmm. has come into play? To be frank, at the beginning of the virus outbreak, we thought this is something that's going to pass, and we only saw the harms limited to the bigger businesses on the main streets where the tourists come, both in Manhattan and Sunset, uh, Sunset Park in Brooklyn, as well as Flushing. Nowadays, we're seeing this economic detriment um, trickling down, not only to restaurants that are most heavily affected, but also to people that are catering to these restaurants. Our printer, for example, has told me that a lot of his orders have been canceled, and they're seeing financial problems right now because the restaurant owners in Flushing that had visited China for you know to visit their family over the Lunar New Year are still there. They can't come back to open the business as scheduled, mm -hmm. so they had to either cancel or forever defer the order that they put in with the printer. We also see that um, it's not only an issue for Asian businesses, but everybody else, like event, um, Bizabo, one of the biggest uh, event um, tech company in New York City, they are also falling off the cliff. So uh, when it comes to the problems here, we, we see that the economic harm is going to start, has already started in the Asian enclaves, but it's only a matter of time before it hits the rest of the city, right? And we haven't seen enough support for them on the ground. I just want to, I want you to elaborate. You said that some of the business owners are stuck in their homeland mm -hmm. uh, and haven't been able to return? Mm -hmm. Is there a moratorium for them to fly in that they can't reopen up their business? Correct, yeah, they weren't able to fly in because they're still on lockdown. They're still on lockdown? But, uh, Back in China. Uh, so the entire country is on lockdown on re-entry into the United States. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I need to go back and find out how many businesses are actually um, unable to open, but I do know there are at least three cases where they weren't able to open on schedule in the beginning of February, and that has hurt our printer's business as well. Ms. Kim, I want to stay in touch with you on this issue and see how we can be helpful Absolutely. in uh, helping you. address this major concern that impacts all of us and it's just not the Asian community. So I want to thank you both for your testimony. Can I just ask a quick question on this? Sure. I don't, I just want, why, why, the, why is there a lockdown? Uh, you mean why did, I met the Chinese government locking down the cities and not allowing people to fly out. So I see. a lot of our uh, merchants have visited, went to China in the middle of January to visit their family for the biggest celebration of the Lunar New Year. And a lot of them still haven't been able to come back. So they are locked in from coming back. Correct. Wow. Is that a is what is is that being challenged in some regard? Um, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your testimony. That will conclude today's hearing.